Welcome back to my final series of lectures in this Introduction to Psychology class. In this lecture, we're going to talk about treatments for mental illness. So we'll start by talking about what happened in the past, so historical approaches to treatment for mental illness. Then we'll talk about medical treatments, and we'll talk about drugs that are given to help people with mental illness, but also some more recent work with actually stimulating the brain. And then we'll discuss psychotherapy or talk therapy. Before we start though, a reminder. I know it's common to think of mental illness as something that you either have or don't have, sort of the two bucket model like I've illustrated here, as if you could put all the mentally ill people in one bucket and all the mentally healthy people in a different bucket. But the world is not black and white, right? It's mostly gray zones. So what you have is shown by this normal distribution here on a document from the University of Cambridge. You have a small number of people on the far right who are flourishing. They're really leading a self-actualized life. In the middle there are people who are experiencing moderate mental health. They're able to live their life, but maybe not to its fullest. Then in the purple, there's a group of people who are languishing. They have some low-level mental illnesses that are holding them back. And then finally, there's a category of people who have mental illness that is in fact limiting their relationships, limiting their job opportunities, limiting the ways in which they could raise their children. So we think of mental health as a spectrum, as a continuum, not as something you have or don't have. I want to start with a brief overview of the history of treatments for mental illness. It's a short history because it's a gruesome history. In the old days, people didn't know what to do with mental illness. They didn't really know how to understand it. Sometimes it was assumed that people with mental illness had been possessed by God or devil. Sometimes mental illness was seen as punishment. Sometimes mental illness was understood as an indication that you were a witch or a warlock. So the treatments were not great. Uh, they involve things like what you see here, a tranquilizing chair in which basically you were tied to a chair, blindfolded, um, your mouth was covered, uh, you couldn't even leave the chair to go to the restroom and you just stayed there until you started to behave the way people wanted you to behave. Obviously not a treatment for mental illness. Uh, there was also something done that we find archaeological evidence for today and that is to drill holes in people's heads. In various places around the world, skulls have been found with a hole, hole in the skull. And the idea there was that mental illness was something in the brain that needed to be let out. If it's evil spirits, then the evil spirits could be let out through the hole in the brain. Now, remember that this was before antibiotics, so there was a very good chance the person would die from infection. Have you ever heard the term bedlam? It means just something that's completely crazy or chaotic. It was bedlam. Well, that term bedlam is actually the nickname for the oldest mental hospital in Europe, which was Bethlehem Royal Hospital. It's existed for over 600 years and it still exists today. In the 1700s, the way they treated people struggling with mental illness was to basically throw everybody together. So whether you were suffering from schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or depression or a learning disability, you were housed together, everyone together, and the treatments were horrible. Uh, they involved beatings, uh, sitting in ice, um, uh, starvation, um, bleeding, blistering, leeches, uh, enforced vomiting. Um, as you can imagine, those treatments weren't terribly effective at curing mental illness. And maybe not surprisingly, on the grounds of this hospital, mass graves have been found. So it was not a pleasant place to go. Today, mental hospitals are much, much better than Bedlam, but there's a different problem. So up until about the 1960s, we had in the US a robust system of mental health hospitals. They were not perfect, far from it, but 
they started to be defunded in the 60s and 70s. And the idea was that these giant mental hospitals, which were big institutions that treated people mm, like numbers instead of individuals, would be replaced with local community mental health hospitals. So someone could live at home and then go to a mental health hospital during the day to be treated. So the funding was cut for the big hospitals, but it was never converted or sent over to build these neighborhood hospitals. If you look at the percentage of people in the US who are in mental hospitals, you see this powder blue curve. It's very high and then it drops off. So you might wonder, well, where did everybody go? Has everyone been cured of their mental illness? No. What happened is they ended up in prisons. It turns out that we are imprisoning many people with mental illness today, so much so that the largest mental hospital in the United States is right here in Los Angeles. Never heard of it? It's the Los Angeles County Prison. I kid you not. One third of the people in that prison receive treatment for mental illness on a regular basis. And that's a very large set of facilities, so one-third makes it the largest mental hospital in America. Who treats mental illnesses? Well, there's lots of different people. The classic one would be a clinical psychologist. This is somebody with a doctorate, maybe a PhD in clinical psychology or a PsyD, which is a doctorate in psychology, in clinical psychology typically. And these are people who have received advanced training, doctoral level training, in how to give talk therapy, how to help people with mental illness identify their problems and develop ways to understand them and respond differently to them. There's also a category called counselors. The biggest difference between counselors and clinical psychologists is that counselors work on more day-to-day -day or applied issues. Uh, they'll focus on things like couples therapy, how, how you, you and your spouse could get along better, or how you might be more effective at work, those sorts of practical issues that certainly are important when dealing with mental illness. There's also psychiatrists. Psychiatrists have an MD. They go to medical school, and after they earn their medical degree, then they go for special training in psychiatry. Psychiatrists are the only type of professional in mental illness who was allowed to give medication. So psychiatrists typically focus on treating mental illness through medications, drugs. Psychoanalyst, a psychoanalyst could have an MD or a PhD, so they could go to medical school or they could go to graduate school in psychology. And after they're done, they get extra training in how to be a Freudian psychoanalyst. There are a couple of master's degrees that allow you to practice therapy. One we've mentioned before, counselors, marriage and family therapy, MFT. Those are folks who run uh, couples counseling and, and family type counseling. There's also something called an LCSW, a licensed clinical social worker. That's somebody who has a master's in social work and has taken extra training um, and testing to uh, demonstrate that they are experts in helping people deal with more applied problems, problems in life, less so uh, mental illnesses per se.